Good morning, Wickland Baptist Church. It's good to see you on Facebook. Look at that. People are already logging in, and uh, we appreciate you logging in. If you are watching uh, by Facebook Live, would you let us know? Just say you're watching. Uh, say uh, we love you because uh, we do love each and every one of you. Man, look at that. People are just logging on. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we just want to uh, uh, share with you. I'm going to share a few announcements here in a minute uh, after the first couple of songs. Uh, but uh, uh, we do want to care for you. Uh, we have people that uh, part of our church family. We've been helping out. Uh, we've had a few that are sick. Uh, we've had some of our senior adults and homebound that needed some help, and we have helped them. So, church, thank you for being such a gracious, giving church, and thank you for uh, just sending your tithes and offering in. The last two months, we've been above and, and beyond our ministry budget needs for the month, and so thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. I just want to read a couple of scriptures as we open uh, uh, our worship service here at uh, Wickland Baptist Church in Bardstown, Kentucky. Then Dave is going to come and share with us a couple of songs, lead us uh, on Facebook Live, and then uh, I'll come back and share for a few minutes. We'll have a couple more songs, then I'll share the message uh, with you. <clears throat> but in Isaiah 49, 16, uh, God's word says this. Lord, look, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Now notice here, he says, look, I've engraved. I put your, the, your name on the palm of my hand. You remember when we have to remember something, we say tie a little bowl around your finger so you can remember uh, whatever you need to do. That's what God is telling the Israelite people. Look, I have engraved you on my hand so I will always keep you on my heart my mind and I will never forget you because I am always with you. And then 2 Corinthians 12, 9, very familiar verse for most of us who are God's uh, people and followers of Christ. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast gladly, and boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. And church, this is why we gather together corporately. Uh, but the last couple of months, we've been gathering together still corporately through technology. We're still the church. We will continue to be the church, whether we are scattered or together. And so just be uh, glad and be thankful and praise the Lord that you're part of the family of faith here at Wickland Baptist Church. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll uh, have some music. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your love and your grace. And God, we thank you that your grace is sufficient for all our needs. And God, may we have faith enough to uh, face our fears through this uh, trying and crazy times that we're living in. God, may we trust in you wholeheartedly that you will help us and, and lead us through this as individuals, as families, and as church family. And God, we love you today. And God, we want you to minister to, the wo to those who are of watching, but who will be watching later on our Facebook Live. God, we pray for each family. We pray, God, that you will bless them and minister to their deepest needs in a powerful way. May they experience the living Christ in their hearts and minds. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Get your Bibles, because here in a few minutes we'll look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Dave is going to come and lead us in some songs. Well, good morning, church. It's so great to be here again. We're going to sing a song that many of you may not know, but some of you might. The important thing is it's a great song. Here we go. Come, now is the time to worship. the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you God, one day every knee will bow, still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship, come, now is the 
the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, just as you are. Come, just as you are. Come. Isn't that a great song? Great song. All right, let's move on with God of grace and God of glory. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown thine ancient church's story, bring her but to glorious power. Grant wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour, for the facing of this hour. When the hosts of evil round us scorn thy Christ, assail thy ways. Fears and doubts too long have bound us, free our hearts to work and pray. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days, for the living of these days. Cure thy children's warring madness, bend our pride to thy control. Shame our want and selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Set our feet on lofty places, gird our lives that they may be, armored with the Christ-like graces in the church you all uh, appreciate your singing in your heart and in your soul at home uh, we do have about uh, 15 people here today because I asked a few to come to kind of do a walk through for next Sunday because we will open our doors up next Sunday at 1030 for our church family so if you feel comfortable you're welcome to come <clears throat> but we do want to encourage those of our senior adult population and those who have health issues, those who maybe just have a little leeriness, to stay home. It's okay. We'll always be on Facebook Live uh, for the, for, for uh, several months or forever. Uh, we're going to stay online as have an online presence. We've been having a lot of people in our community, and, and to be honest with you, from other states, been watching each week, and uh, we're glad that they are there. So, <clears throat> church family, Wickland Baptist Church. Next Sunday, May the 24th, we will gather together again in this facility. Uh, we've never closed our doors. We just stayed home and been scattered and still being the church. But now we're going to come back. But here's the thing, church, I want you to understand. We will be practicing social distance. Uh, we will be uh, sitting six feet apart. Uh, every other row in our sanctuary will be seated on the aisle so we can have six feet in between the families on each end of the pews. So... We are trying to keep people safe. Uh, again, if you've been sick in the last few days or you're sick next Sunday, please, please, please stay home. None of us that who are coming want to get sick. But if you want, 
We are encouraging to wear masks if that makes you feel comfortable. And we do have some temporary masks here the, the, that if you forgot one, you can have one to put on. We have sanitizer uh, hands everywhere. Uh, we have uh, our custodian came in yesterday and she sanitized the place. She'll come in this afternoon and do it again after uh, we leave. And so we'll keep the building safe and clean and sanitized for you. Again, you come when you feel comfortable. We, re we will respect you and it's okay, okay? We can only seat about uh, 50, 55 in the sanctuary, but we will have an overflow in our fellowship hall. Uh, we can seat anywhere, anywhere between 10 and 20, 25. It depends the size of the families. You get that? The size of the family will dictate how many people that we can have. Uh, <clears throat> after the uh, next Sunday, or the following Sunday, if we need to go to two services, we will go to two services to accommodate the people who want to come. So we'll have a 9 o'clock and then a 1030. The 9 o'clock will give us time to clean uh, the pews and clean the restrooms and everything in between the two services if we have to go uh, that route. So May the 24th, a week from today, if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to come. Sit social distance, no handshaking, uh, no hugging. Uh, try, try to respect everybody uh, and uh, be safe. We just want to come and praise the Lord. And uh, so we're going to have a good time uh, next Sunday as we come together. So just want to encourage you. If you want to stay home, watch Facebook, that's okay because we'll be on Facebook. And I know many of our seniors are watching now. I've been watching the, the scrolls and the comments, and we appreciate that. Uh, if you... Uh, uh, feel like God is still moving in your life, type amen, hallelujah on Facebook. And the few that are here today, if you feel like God is still moving in your life, say amen. amen. So see, God is still on his throne. He's still uh, moving. He's still ministering to his church. He's still going to do a great thing through this. He will see us through this if we do our part and show love and serve one another in a way that will please him. So, next Sunday, uh, looking forward for everybody being here. And uh, it, it would be great if we had to go to the second service because people want to come back to church. But I know several folks will probably wait a month or two to see how this plays out before they come. And that's okay. I look forward to that. Uh, statistics are showing some of the churches that already started in other, other states. They're running anywhere between 25 to 40% of their normal attendance the first three or four weeks. And that's okay. We want people to be safe. We want people to fear, to, to feel comfortable when they do come back that this will be a safe place to worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. So we're glad that you're watching Facebook Live. And uh, I'm telling you, it's a pretty day outside. And it's a beautiful day as we continue to sing as Dave leads us. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord. 
<laughs> Before we sing the next one, I just realized I didn't have to put my face in my arm to cough, did I? I got a mask on. <laughs> Trying to get used to this. And it's not so hard to sing with this on. This is working great. Okay. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And forever we sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth Let's go at the beginning again. We can sing this again. I'm so sorry. Can we get back to the beginning? All right. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing That's the important thing. Yes? Amen. Amen. All right, church, get your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. <clears throat> We've been going through the storyline of the Bible. Uh, those who are watching on Facebook Live, they're not part of our church. From uh, Genesis all the way through Revelation, <clears throat> uh, starting in January, we'll go through that storyline of the Bible, the whole story of the Bible. Uh, through uh, after the Sunday, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. So we're in 1 Samuel. Uh, the last two Sundays we were in Judges, and now we're in 1 Samuel chapter 8. <clears throat> Just want to share with you that uh, 1 Samuel uh, takes place about uh, 110 years uh, uh, through the 1 Samuel. The journey of 1 Samuel it was about 110 years. Uh, they moved from the Judges. Uh, remember last couple Sundays we talked about uh, judges that were, uh, God uh, gave them judges, raised up judges to, to share the word of God, to help the people of God to repent, get back to worshiping him. Then all of a sudden they would for a while and then they would uh, uh, worship the idols and then uh, he would raise up another judge. And so 1 Samuel now is transitioning uh, to the kings. Uh, they're going to be moving away from the judges. They're going to start with the kings. Uh, Samuel is the last judge. Uh, we're going to be, uh, if you look at toward the end, at around chapter 10, 11, and 12, uh, you'd see that uh, Saul was chosen to be the king, and then Solomon and David, and so forth. 
And the theme of 1 Samuel is this. And the theme is leaders and nations change, but God's purpose never changes. Leaders throughout every generation of churches, of political, of, of jobs, of careers, whatever, and nations will change through different seasons of life, different generations. But God's purpose never changes, and he's always moving his purpose forward no matter what's happening with the leaders and nations. <clears throat> Uh, Samuel was, again, the last judge. Uh, chapters 1 through 12 of 1 Samuel is talking about the birth of Samuel, the call of Samuel with Eli, uh, the ministry and the change that's coming about. He captures the ark, and, uh, and then we see, uh, starting chapter 13 through 16, uh, the rejection of Saul. Uh, the people didn't like uh, Saul being uh, chosen as first king because of the way he lived. And in the last several chapters, 17 through 31, it was reality or the rebellion against God and David was anointed the king and then you know the story of David and Goliath uh, in, in the book of, of 1 Samuel. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been surprised? Have you ever gone through life and you just, oh wow, had a wow moment? It might have been with your family, it might have been here at church, it might have been at work, it might have been on the ball field. Uh, I remember one time I was very surprised in my first full-time church. Uh, we were playing softball. At that time, I was single, and I was on the softball field probably three or four nights a week. I loved playing softball <clears throat> and uh, pitched and played second. And uh, I was playing with a lot of my teenagers uh, and some adults. And uh, about three weeks before this game happened, I was taking a bunch of uh, teenagers from Cynthiana, where my church, where I was serving at, to Frankfurt for the Youth Evangelism Conference at the Civic Center. And dummy me, I was uh, uh, not paying attention, and I was going about six to seven miles over the speed limit, and a state trooper pulled me over. And the teenagers were surprised. But that wasn't the surprise for me. About three weeks later, we were having this game, and, and uh, <clears throat> I walked out at the... At the uh, at the home plate where both teams gathered together to have a word of prayer. And I turned around and there stood that state trooper that pulled me over three weeks earlier. And he had a, a t-shirt uh, that had uh, the fast chicken weenie on it. The chicken was, I had a cookout a week before I pulled him, I got pulled over and uh, instead of buying beef hot dogs, I bought chicken hot dogs. And so that's why the T-shirt. And so the, all the teenagers laughed. They thought they got, uh, got me, and I was surprised seeing that state trooper there. We gave each other high fives and, and had a good time. But uh, we're all surprised at different times. I remember Charles Swindoll in one of his books uh, in my office, he shared a story one time that a man and a woman uh, was going on a picnic uh, to a lake. And so on their way to the lake, they stopped at Lee's Famous Recipe Chicken, and they were going to get lunch. And so they got their, uh, the order in for chicken and the large drink. They went to the lake. They put out <clears throat> the, uh, a blanket. They put out all the, the paper products. And they sat down and, re and opened the Lee's bag to get the chicken out. And they were surprised. It was full of money, not chicken. It was full of money. And so <clears throat> they packed up everything. And they took this sack back into uh, Lee's famous, and they asked for the manager, and the manager came, and he, they said, uh, we're sorry, but we didn't get our chicken. We got this bag, and the manager looked in there, and he said, oh, no. He said, I laid it probably beside your order. I turned around for about five seconds, and the cashier must gave you that. He says, let me take a picture of you, uh, <clears throat> both of you all, put it in the newspaper to show how good morals and value <clears throat> and how uh, you want to do the right thing. And the man said, no, 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 you can't do that. And the manager kept insisting and insisting, we want your picture. And the man kept saying no. He says, why don't you want your picture in the, in the paper? He said, there's two reasons. Number one, <clears throat> my boss doesn't know that I'm going on a picnic. He thinks I'm sick at home. And secondly, this is not my wife. <laughs> Surprise! <clears throat> Surprise happens every day of our lives. I want to ask you, <clears throat> in what ways do you stand out 
are different in this world. As a believer, as a Christian, <clears throat> as a disciple of Christ, what makes you stand out differently than the other people that you hang out with? Are you different outside these walls? Now, during this COVID-19, <clears throat> we had opportunity to be, continue to be the church. Checking in on each other and showing love and showing grace and, and helping people when they needed help. Let me ask you another question. <clears throat> what do you turn to for satisfaction and fulfillment in your life besides Christ? What do you look to uh, for fulfillment and satisfaction in your life instead of Christ? Have you ever made a choice? That you wish you had not made that choice. Have you made a decision? And you look back and say, "Whoops, I made a, I made a, 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 a mistake. I was surprised by how that decision, that choice, really turned out." Well, in our scripture passage today, uh, we're going to actually see uh, that <clears throat> uh, see that uh, uh, that the Israelites and Samuel. Uh, wanted a change. They, they were surprised, especially Samuel, uh, here in chapter 8, how the people of God uh, was wanting to react. Uh, instead of judges, they were asking for a king. They wanted somebody to come and rule over them and, and, and fight their battles for them. And we know, as Christians, sometimes we want other people to fight our battles for us. And the question through this chapter is this. Is God enough? Is God enough to fight our battles, to give us power and strength, to give us satisfaction and fulfillment? So let's read in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> we're going to look at verses 1 through 9, and we're going to see in this section that when they demanded a king, they admitted that God is not enough for them. So let's read verse 1. <clears throat> when Samuel grew old... He appointed his sons as judges over Israel. His firstborn son name was Joel. His second son was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. <clears throat> However, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned toward dishonest prophet, took bribes, and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and went to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, Look, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Therefore, appoint a king to judge us the same as all the other nations. And when they said, give us a king to judge us, <clears throat> Samuel considered their demand wrong. He said, that's a wrong attitude. That's a wrong way of looking at things. And so he said, <clears throat> so he prayed to the Lord. Notice the first thing that Samuel did. He prayed. Is that... The first thing you do, and I do, and we as a church do, as followers and believers of Christ, when we come up with a, a decision or, or something that's hard in our life, do we pray first and see what God's going to say to us? Samuel did that. And notice it says, <clears throat> so he prayed to the Lord, verse 7, but the Lord told him, listen to the people and everything they say to you. They have not rejected you. <clears throat> they have rejected me as their king. They're, all, they're doing the same thing to you that they have done to me. Since the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, they're abandoning me and worshiping other gods. So listen to them, but solemnly warn them and tell them about the customary rights of the king who will reign over them. <clears throat> Here, verses 1 through 9, <clears throat> things were not going so well. The people had three these... These elders had three things that they were concerned about. Number one, Samuel was old. <laughs> they didn't think he had uh, the gumption enough or the strength enough or the wisdom enough. He was not all in his right mind possibly to continue to lead them. said, so you're old. You put your two sons as judges. And let's be honest, Samuel, they're not walking with the Lord. They're not acting like you act. They're not having the faith and trust in, the, in their God as you do. <clears throat> and so look how they're living. They're walking evil. They're, they're disrupting. They're, they're uh, perverting uh, <clears throat> the way of life. And then we want to be like all the other nations. That's the third thing. 
We don't want to be any different than other nations. We want to be like them. We, we look at the other nations out there and, and we see that uh, they are prospering. They, uh, their kings and, and their leaders are fighting their battles for them. And, and they are, are just uh, having security and they're having a wonderful life. So Samuel, let's get a king here. We don't want your sons. <laughs> we want to be like uh, the other nations. <clears throat> and we see here that Samuel, in verse chapters 1 and 2, was born from Hannah. Uh, he was uh, Israel's greatest prophets. He had directly uh, given the, 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 the people the word of God, how to live. The people were kind of following him uh, for the most part until he appointed his sons to be judges. And <clears throat> Samuel sensed that the people requested represented a lack of trust and faith in God. And so that's why he said it was wrong for them to think this way. They doubted. They didn't have confidence in Samuel or <clears throat> their, their God. And God was supposed to be their true king. And so they depended on everything else. And here's the thing. But the people were asking for something more than God. Now notice here they trusted God. But they didn't trust him solely for fulfillment and satisfaction, prosperity and security. They said we want God and all this other stuff over here. We want God but we want to be like the other nations. We want God but we want to have material stuff. We want, to, we want somebody to fight our battles here on this earth for us. So see, it wasn't that they didn't have trust and faith in God. They did have trust and faith in God, but not fully. It was God addition to some other stuff. They added more stuff with their relationship with God. And so the people had not rejected God outright. They were just saying, yes, God, we believe you, but we're just not sure if you are enough. We're not sure that you have the power to deal with our battles and everything we're going through. And in verses 4 and 5, it said the elders gathered, and it was really going back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, 400 years before this happened. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, God clearly laid out the expectation that the king would lead his people one day and so the Israelites requested the king. They remember back in Deuteronomy days when it was written and when it was shared and said, well, now we want the king 400 and several generations later. So 1 Samuel 8 <clears throat> was no surprise, nor <clears throat> was there wicked motivation behind their request. It was kind of a, a not a godly request. Uh, they trusted God, but... They didn't really trust God at the same time. They, they were kind of straddling the fence, so to speak. And some of us probably have done that in our lives. We, we have straddled the fence uh, in some ways. We say, yes, God, we trust you. But then we kind of lean over here to the worldly ways and to our self ways and to our pride, and to the things that our desires instead of what God <clears throat> has for us. And then... Verses 6 and 7, it says that Samuel, in some translation, said he was displeased. In the Christian uh, standard Bible that I read while ago, said they were wrong. He, he was uh, displeased. Have you ever been displeased with your spouse or with your children or with a co-worker, with a church member, with a friend? We all have. So now we can understand where Samuel was coming from, that they were displeased, he was displeased by the attitude and the motivation of the, of the elders. <clears throat> uh, there are two ways that you can reject God. Two ways you can reject God. <clears throat> that is that there are, <clears throat> that one is to reject him totally outright. There is no God, there is no creator, there is no uh, reason why I don't trust the Bible, the Bible is just a myth. I just don't believe in God. That's one way to reject God. And only 2 to 3 percent, according to 2015 Pew Research, says that United States, people in the United States say that, that they don't believe that there is a God, that they're atheists. Only 2 to 3 percent in 2015. I'd say it's a little higher at this point in time, 2020. The second way you can reject God is to follow God, but to insist something else to help God. I trust you, God, with my finances, but I'm going to make my own decisions with my finances. 
I trust you, God, with my home, but I'm going to make my own decisions in my home. God, I trust you, but God, you sure your word really means what it says? And so we trust God, but we add all these other things because we don't trust God wholeheartedly. And then verses 10 through 18, not only did they demand a king, uh, they opened the door to enslavement. They opened the door to enslavement. Look at verses 10 <clears throat> very quickly. Samuel told all the Lord's words <clears throat> to the people who were asking him for a king. Verse 11, <clears throat> he said, These are the rights of the kings who will reign over you. He will take your sons and put them <clears throat> to use in his chariots and <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, on his horses are running in front of his chariots. He can appoint them for use of his commanders of thousands or commanders of fifties to plow his ground and reap his harvest or to make his weapons or war. He can, verse 13, he can take your daughters to be become perfumers and cooks and bakers. Verse 14, he can take your best fields and your vineyards and your olives. Verse 15, he can take <clears throat> a tenth of your grain and your vineyards. Verse 16, he can take your male servants and your female servants, your best young men. Verse 17, <clears throat> he can take a tenth of your flocks and of yourself uh, can become his servants. Verse 18, when that day comes, you will cry out because the king you have chosen for yourself, but the Lord won't answer you on that day. So when they did not trust God fully, it was like the last two Sundays we talked about in Judges. They worshiped idols. They were adding other stuff with their relationship with God. And that became an opening door to their hearts and their minds to accept, to worship, to believe in other things outside of the relationship with God. And so they were enslaved <clears throat> to the open door of enslavement. <clears throat> Samuel didn't hold back when he foretold. This was pretty bold, wasn't it? That Samuel told the people <clears throat> that <clears throat> if you want a king, this is what the king's going to do. He's going to take pretty much everything. He's not going to protect you the way you think he's going to protect you and lead you. He will not fight your battles the way he's going to <clears throat> fight your battles. <clears throat> the Israelites looked to the king to guarantee prosperity and security. <clears throat> and we know that Samuel was telling them that this king was not going to do what they think he was going to do. He was going to be more in control than they in control of him. Now, in verses 19 through 22, we see that when they demanded a king, they looked just like everyone else. That's why I asked you the question earlier is there any difference in your Christian walk than anybody out there in the community that's not a Christian? Can people see the love of Christ in you? Is there a difference? We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. We're supposed to be in the world and living and sharing the gospel, glorifying God and doing what God asks us to do. But we're not supposed to partake of the worldly ways. And so here in verses 19 through 22, they look just like everyone else. Look at verse 19. The people refused to listen to Samuel. <laughs> Is there people today that refuses to listen to God, to the church, to political, to, to their mom and dads, to their spouses, uh, uh, to their children, on and on and on? Yes. That problem still goes on today. Notice here, it says, The people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we must have a king over us. We don't think what you're telling us, Samuel, is actually accurate and true. They're not going to take as much as you say they're going to take. We want the king anyway, because we don't trust God fully. And notice it goes on in verse 20. <clears throat> then we will be like all other nations, our king will judge us, go out before us, and fight our battles. Only God can fight your battles. <clears throat> if it is a spiritual battle, only Christ, your relationship with Christ, can fight your battles. 
The people here were not understanding that. They were looking to a human. They were looking to a king to go out and fight all their physical, their mental, their emotional, their spiritual battles for them. It is only in Christ that he can fight the battles. God is a loving father who has gone to great lengths to rescue his people over and over and over again in the Old Testament. And yet Israel still wanted to be like all the other nations. But, it, but we noticed here that in verse uh, 22, listen, it goes on and says in verse 21, Samuel, listen to all the people's words and then repeat them to the Lord. Listen to them, the Lord told Samuel. Appoint a king for them. Then Samuel told the men of Israel, each of you go back to your city. Samuel, God knew it was wrong, but God went ahead and said, okay, if y'all want a king, I'll give you a king. If you want to go your own way, I'll let you go your own way. If you don't want to follow me, I'll say, okay, I'll back up, God says, and I'll let you go your own way. That's what Romans, throughout the book of Romans, tells us, that he allowed the people go their own way when they were sinning. <clears throat> and we noticed that. Uh, and so <clears throat> the, the Israelites here wanted a safety net. They wanted a safety net. They wanted like a child wants a blanket when they're little to go to sleep or, or a stuffed animal. They wanted that security. They wanted that safety net, that, that comfort. And this is what the Israelites were doing. They wanted not only God to comfort them, they wanted this king, this human uh, person uh, to help them uh, to have security in that. God rightly calls this a rejection of him. Remember he said, Samuel, it's not against you, it's against me. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And so I'll let them go ahead and go down this path and we'll see <laughs> what's going to happen in their life. And then verse 9, we go back to verse 9, God calls this request for a king disobedience. Uh, this is a little confusing. So why did God knew it was wrong, but he went ahead and let him go down that path. Why did he do that? Sometimes for you and I, we have to learn through the school of hard knocks, don't we? That's what my dad always said, said to us poor kids. You will listen to your mom and I, but there are times when you won't listen to us because you've got to learn through the school of hard knocks. And God looks at you and I as his children, as his believers, and as his followers, and says, okay, if you want to go down that path and you truly don't want to trust me and believe in me, then I'll let you go down that path and I will help you to understand that your choice was not the right choice. And it will help you to turn back toward me. And so here's a couple things very quickly that we can see out of this story. Kind of word for us. And the story of Israel's rejection of God is a cautionary for you and I for today. <clears throat> the desire to conform to the world. That's another, that's a caution. You remember we have red light, we have a caution light, then we have a green light. The caution light tells us to be careful going through the intersection because it's about ready to turn red. God's word here is giving us a caution sign. Blink, blink, yellow. Be careful, you're going down the wrong path. You're conforming to the world. So the desire to conform to the world is, is we got to be cautious of that. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. <clears throat> this is your true and proper worship. Listen, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. This is what the Israelites did not understand. They wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted to be like the world. And God's word in the New Testament says, be cautious to follow your friends who are going down the wrong path because they will take you with them. Be careful. Go by the renewing of your mind and your heart in Christ and you go down the path of transformation with him. As long as God does this, he prevents you and I <clears throat> and he provides prevents us to go down the wrong path and he helps us to follow him wholeheartedly in our lives. Our society is full of people willing to make room for God as a piece of the puzzle. Right? We have home. That's a piece of a puzzle. 
have finances, we have hobbies, we have parents, uh, we have children, we have spouses, we have uh, uh, work, we have uh, different things that brings our life together. They're pieces of a puzzle. And God is a small piece for most of us. It's not one of the larger pieces of the puzzle, it's a small piece. And it's sometimes hard to find if you ever worked a puzzle. You're trying to find one little piece and, and you look and you look and you look. That's the way it is sometimes with our walk with Christ. We have to be careful. If we truly want the, the true joy and the peace and satisfaction only in Christ, then we have to turn on those caution lights and, okay, we're not going to be conformed to the worldly ways. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our heart and our minds to Christ and follow Him. When we begin to trust God alone with our entire life, we will look different from those around us. Secondly, verses 9 through 18 tells us the consequences of rejecting God's ways. That's another word for us. <clears throat> if we uh, do not follow God, we have consequences of rejecting His ways. Do, not, do we not as parents tell our children, no, you, not, you shall not do that, or I'll put you in time out, or I'll take your bicycle away, or this. Doesn't teachers do this? If you do not do your homework, I'll take your PE time away. We all have consequences, but the problem is, like the elders and the people here in this text, we today are like them. We don't want to own up and take our, be responsible for our choices and actions, and we don't want to go down the road of consequences of the wrong decision we make in rejecting God. Rejecting God's will and His purpose and His ways is the same as rejecting God Himself. So when God tells you to go down this path and you say no, then you're rejecting Him totally. Even though we try to walk with Him. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ sets us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to yoke of slavery. The worldly ways, just like the Israelites, people here in this text, want to be like the nation. So if you want to be like your community, then you're going to be enslaved and go down the wrong path. And then thirdly, the caution light, caution light. Be careful what you ask for. Be careful for what you ask for. Verses 19 through 22, God says, okay, you want a king? I'll let you go down the right path. So be careful what you ask for. Have you ever been bl blindsided by your desires and realized that your desires was not the right desire or the right choice, decision that you made? Samuel tells God what they said, and God says, let them have it. Let them go down that path. Romans 1, 21 through 25 says this. For they knew God. He's talking about believers here. Romans saying they knew God, but now they're going to mess up. He says, for they knew God, and they did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. They rejected Him. They were not following Him totally like the Israelite people here in our text today. <clears throat> Instead, their thinking became worthless. Senseless hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, but they were really fools. And he exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, and footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity and other sexual stuff so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what had been created instead of the Creator, who is praised forever. This text is saying, just like the Israelites, instead of praising and following the Creator, they wanted what He created. It ought to be the other way around. We follow the Creator, and then we experience what He has created for us. And so we need to understand, we need to be careful for what we ask for. Proverbs 22, 3 says, A prudent or sensible person sees danger and takes cover, but the inexperienced or the fool keeps going and are punished. Consider what lies ahead and the consequences. Consider the consequences. Three things in closing. 
How do you overcome these cautions? First, you need to humble yourself before Christ. When you go to Christ in prayer, when you praise Him, when you exalt His name, when you acknowledge His greatness as creator of all and have authority over your life, then you will confess your sinful ways and humble yourself before the Creator. So humble yourself. You're not above God. God is above you. Secondly, seek God's will and His purpose first. Seek God's plan and His purpose first in your life. Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. 1 John 5, 14-15 says this, This is confidence we have before Him if we ask anything according to His will. Listen, according to His will, not our will, He hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. In other words, it's the right motive. It's the right purpose. God, I want what you want for my life. I'm not asking you to give me what I want. I want what you want for my life. And then James 4, 3 says, You ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. So pray for Christ's wisdom Pray for Christ's discernment and meditate on his word of, uh, daily and seek godly counsel from others. Seek his plan and purpose first. And then lastly, trust God with the answer. And this is the problem that you and I have as well as the Israelites had. Sometimes when God gives an answer, we don't trust it, do we? When he says, yes, I'll answer your prayer, we're okay with it. But when God says, I'm going to delay your answer because you're not quite ready for the answer yet. I need to mature you. I need to grow you. I need to maneuver you through your walk with me before I answer that prayer. And sometimes we struggle how God answers our prayer. And how God answers our prayer determines our trust factor in him. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Listen, you don't pray for God's peace. It is not through your prayer <clears throat> that you only have experienced God's prayer. It is in Christ, your relationship in Christ, that you have peace. And he says, as you pray, I will guard that peace in your hearts and your mind. You have the peace within you. It is up to you whether or not you tap into it. To follow Christ as king of our lives, we must step out on faith. In other words, <clears throat> we need to believe that God is already there and he will do what he says he will do. That's faith. So we need to step out on faith with absolutely no conditions, no additions, no multiplications to his perfect will in our lives, but it, no exceptions, no uh, but God, but God, just complete confidence in him. Because of the cross, we know that Christ is our king, he is trustworthy, and he will do what God's word says he will do for us. So never forget that Christ is good enough and that's all you need is your relationship with Christ and Christ alone. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father God, we thank you for Samuel's lesson and this text, how God, that sometimes we need to put the caution light on in our lives and seek you more in prayer and your word and the things that you have in store for us. Help us to humble ourselves. Help us to seek your holy face for leadership and for guidance and for wisdom, for discernment. God, help us to trust the answer that you're going to give us. Help us not to be like the Israelites in this text and say, I trust you, God, but I trust you, God, if I trust you, God, thank you, God, for what you're going to do in my life. And God, we thank you. We thank you for how you're moving in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before Dave comes, I just want to say to you who are listening by Facebook, if you want to 
uh, have someone pray for you, you want to know more about this loving relationship with Christ, you can Facebook message us, give us your telephone number or email, you can call the church office, and we'll con contact you. We would love to follow up with you on any need, prayer need that you have, or your relationship that you want to have with the Lord Jesus. Remember, God loves you, and he has a purpose and a plan for your life. Just trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Come on, Dave, lead us. Y'all can stand. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow worship him in righteousness we will worship him alone he is lord of heaven lord of earth he is lord of all who live he is lord above the universe all praise to him we give hallelujah to the king of kings hallelujah to the Hey, church, it's glad, we're so glad that you worship with us, a few here, and then also by Facebook Live, and those who will be watching later, uh, we thank you for uh, that. We pray that God has blessed your life in a very special way through the words of the music, the prayers, the teaching of his word, and again, we hope that you will experience the living Christ this week as you trust in him and follow him fully in your walk with him. May you have a great week. May you have a great lunch. And may God just pour his blessings from heaven upon you this week in a mighty, mighty way. I'm out. Have a good day.